Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Hi, I'm Bob Dambach, and welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. On this edition, we'll visit a museum where only kids get to ring the bells, journey to an emigration museum in Iceland, and enjoy the music of a string quartet. Growing up, Rodney Haug loved kaleidoscopes. In 1988, he started creating them. Today, he is one of only a handful of kaleidoscope artists in the entire United States. When I was a kid, my mom bought me a kaleidoscope and I, I was having fun with it, holding it up to the sun and just digging it. And I thought, I gotta know how this works. So I, I didn't ask permission. I thought better to ask for forgiveness than permission that I went and got a bread knife and it was cardboard. So I just <laughs> sawed the end off of it. And I was just amazed at how simple it is. All you're seeing is a pie-shaped slice of the colored chips that's multiplied by reflection into a circle. Total kaleidoscope artists in the United States, it's, it's in the hundreds of people, but uh, people making the large ones, it's less than 10, and I'm one of the ones that makes big scopes. With the larger scopes, you kind of build them from the inside out. Uh, the mirror system is the heart of the kaleidoscope, so you figure out uh, what size mirrors you want. First uh, measure twice, got it set there. There's all kinds of mirror systems. You can use two mirrors, three mirrors. I like the two mirrors. It just gives you a nice symmetrical pattern. I had to make this myself. Um, that's the thing with kaleidoscopes. Uh, you can't go to the kaleidoscope tool store. Now, I would assemble all my components, and what I would do is I would peel this protective surface off. As soon as you peel that protective surface off, dust starts falling out of the air, and it starts landing on there, and you'd be surprised uh, at how, how well you can see any dust particle that falls on this stuff. Quickly get this piece in, quickly get this piece in. I have roughly set the gauge here for a 30 degree angle. That gives me a six pointed star pattern. I would very quickly set the flat black surface that's the third side of the mirror tube. I would put the weights on. Once I've got my mirrors set, then I would put the end glass against each end of the mirror tube and I would use a silicone glue to just dab glue in about five different places to tack it. Then I walk away for about six hours and don't even touch it. Then I come back and go with a bead of glue and seal all, every seam on there. The object chamber is generally the chamber that tumbles around the colored pieces that form the kaleidoscopic image. We need to fit these glass lenses for an object chamber that I'm working on. I'm just a hair too big, so we're gonna take my poor old ancient glass grinder here, wet down the bit a little bit for cooling, and we're just gonna take the high spots off the corner, or off the edge of the glass here. Ta-da! If you have an object chamber, one piece of glass is clear, and the front piece of glass is opaque. The reason for that is you don't want to look down your mirrors through your colored chips and then see what's beyond the scope. This uh, diffuses the light so that all you see is that wonderful snowflake pattern. The reason I like the larger scopes is because they give you a, a huge pattern most of the time. It, it, the pattern you see looks you know, about this big and it's out about a foot in front of you. Uh, my larger scopes will give you a pattern that seems like it's almost a foot to cross. That's just real visually striking. It's real easy to make a, a kaleidoscope. It's real hard to make one that's really good. I know it sounds 
artsy fartsy, but I do it because I like to do it. And I figure if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it well and see if I can find some collectors to collect my well-built kaleidoscopes. If I can't, then I'm gonna make them anyway. I got more room in the back, I <laughs> put them back there. But they find a home. There's always somebody that wants them. We're gonna just take these strips of glass, heat them up until they get to be about the consistency of taffy, and then we're just gonna bend them and twist them around a little bit to come up with little shapes, oh, like that. We're gonna fire up the torch here. The trick in a chamber like this is to use enough clear pieces so that it holds the colored pieces apart a little bit. I found that this is more art than anything else. You, you just have to experiment with it and see what works. Those glass blowers that talk about that power over the glass to make it something, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's quite that dramatic here, but yeah, it's neat. Glass is supposed to be brittle and, and crack. And when you can make it soft and flowing and then make it into these nifty curly Q shapes, uh, it's, it's just fun. And then uh, it just happens to work really well for a kaleidoscope object chamber. This is the largest object chambers that I've ever made. Uh, it's a nine inch diameter object chamber. It's an oil filled chamber. I think you can see that there when I turn it. Uh, it's filled with a 10,000 weight silicone oil. And these colored pieces are what I was just lamp working. That's an example of lamp worked glass. With the bigger ones, it's just, just the wow factor. The ones out at West Acres, uh, people literally line up to look at them and and just hearing all the oohs and the ahs and the wows, I just get a kick out of it. It just gives me a little thrill. So that's, that's the inspiration. The Pioneer Village in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, provides a living history of the area from its early years as a rural community to its current role as an economic hub. The part about this museum that makes it very unique is that so much of it is connected personally to the people that lived here. We put names on the items so that the people get credit for them, but also to personalize this museum so that it belongs to the people. We're in the Engelstead building as part of the Petter Engelstead Pioneer Village which is on Oakland Park Road in Thief River Falls. Inga Giving solicited buildings from all over this area and Inga asked Ralph Engelstead to please build a roof. Ralph said, I'll build you a building. And so Ralph built this Engelstead building. Then he asked the board of directors to name the village for his grandfather, Petter Engelstead. When I first started here, that one of the first activities that we scheduled was called Park and Rec Pioneer Days. And for the first time in my life, I met Matt Langwin. One of the things that Matt will tell you is that when he was a child, his parents took him to museums, but he could never enjoy the museum because everything was behind a rope or under glass. And when he came here, he could sit in chairs, he could sit in the schoolhouse, he could pick books up and look at them. He could pick up dishes and look at them. And why that's an important factor is Matt is legally blind. Being legally blind and being able to get up, up close to it and touch things and feel things and getting up close really helped me in doing that. And other museums, that's not possible. You feel like you're taking a step back in time and you're, you're experiencing what life was like at a different time. And Coming to this museum was the first time I ever had that experience. Before coming here, I, I never knew that life was different back at one time. Matt has learned to become a tour guide. He knows and memorizes everything about the village. He loves the history aspect of it. He had to actually cut it in half. And then uh, Inga Giving, who was the director at the time, actually wrote on uh, one of the halves when they brought it in. One of the spin-offs of the accessibility that came as a result of probably Matt's influence on me is that we have made policies throughout the village. Most of the time when kids come to a museum, they're forbidden to do so many things. And we tell them that we want them to have a good time and one of the things we've warned them about is adults are not allowed to ring bells in the village. 
Only children can. Ringing those bells has become a big thing. There's a bell out by the tree, and there's one in the school, and there's one in the church. And the thing we also encourage is for families to come out and have a picnic here, to play school, to sit in the cabins and pretend they lived there and try to figure out where people lived, where they slept, how they'd take a bath. Big question is, where do you go to the bathroom? And most of them have never seen an outhouse. The one great northern depot that we have serves not as a depot museum, but as a museum of Thief River Falls. It has various rooms with different types of displays, like there's a car dealership, there's a beauty shop, and there's a lane that we call Typewriter Alley that has old typewriters. The Viking Depot served as a depot where the family lived. The building is preserved as a depot except for the freight room where we put the logging material. The schoolhouse was moved from southeast of town and it's pretty much the way it was except that the parts of it come together after it gets here like the desks. The rest of the village is a collection of stores and there's a Victorian house which we chose to paint like a painted lady because there's nothing colored out here, and there's uh, five full-size cabins, and there's a homestead cabin. In the future, Jamie Bakken will bring all of the fifth graders from the Challenger Middle School. Every kid in fifth grade now has come. There are Minnesota history standards in fifth grade um, in our social studies standards, and so the main thing that we're looking at is how technology has changed over time. So the museum is very open to the children, you know, they can actually feel the books and touch the books, and I think that's really great to have that part of history available to them rather than just, you know, you go to some other museums and everything's behind glass and don't touch, be quiet, and here the kids get to ring the school bell and, and do all that fun stuff. One of the things when visitors come through that you notice is the things like they will stop almost by the door and say, I turned one of those when I was a kid. And they remember things from their past. And in fact, one of the things I find a favorite vision is seeing a grandfather with a grandchild and telling the child the parts of a harness or the parts of a wagon and that kind of thing that grandparents and parents know. And the fact that it's a, a personal thing where that they can relate their own experiences to the buildings here and not just somebody else lived here but they can remember parts of their own lives that are here, are right here. On the banks of Lake Winnipeg, Nelson Gerard collects and protects photographs from around the world that record Icelandic immigration. The Immigration Center at Hofsos provides people with information that is not readily available anywhere else. There are three exhibits at Hofsos. The first exhibit was the story of why the immigrants left and their experiences during the first years. I think it's called New Land, New Life. The second exhibit focuses on the Icelandic settlement in North Dakota and again explores that with pictures and stories and first-hand experiences. And the third exhibit is one called Silent Flashes, which is the newest. It was set up in 2004. And that exhibit really came about through a long process of collection. Those pictures had been sort of filtering into me uh, at my center here, mostly from people who were just looking to find a good home for their old pictures that didn't mean much to them anymore. The uh, Silent Flashes exhibit covers the time period from 1870 to 1910 approximately and is a selection of photographs that represent basically the immigrant experience in North America. The process of selecting the photographs was actually very difficult, not because there were so few, but because there were so many. The Silent Flashes exhibit uh, actually consists of more than 400 photographs, some very large, some rather small in the presentation. The categories of photographs came out of 
an attempt to bring some order to this mass collection of, of photographic work. Subject matter became the obvious way. Pictures of babies, pictures of newlyweds, pictures of families, pictures of elderly pioneers who had sort of weathered the storm. They are incredible photographs. The caliber of photography during the 1880s and 90s was really surprising. Of the 16 photographers uh, featured in the exhibit uh, at Hofsos, probably the most important one is Jon Blundell, who was a Winnipeg photographer. He became a, a little bit of a hero in the story of photography and the pioneers in that um, he made a real effort to travel out to the settlements and to capture images of many of the pioneer families. When I built this home in 1988, 89, I actually established it as the Aderbaki Icelandic Heritage Centre. The um, archive I have upstairs has one of the largest collections of genealogical material about things Icelandic here in North America. The only place that the microfilm of the Icelandic ministerial records exists in North America, apart from Salt Lake City, is here. Well, I grew up as a farm boy uh, in western Manitoba with the soil of Manitoba under my fingernails, so no no Icelandic uh, input there really, but my mother did always have a few stories and we had little remnants of culture like the, the cooking and uh, the odd custom like opening our gifts on Christmas Eve and we always knew of this connection and of course people like to be related to famous people so we heard that we were related to the explorer Wilhelmer Stephenson and that we were descended from a bishop back in Iceland. And these were things that sort of fired the imagination of a, of a prairie boy. I remember sitting down at the kitchen table with my mother and a big piece of paper. And um, just from her knowledge, uh, we drew up a family tree. The Department of Icelandic had been established at the University of Manitoba in 1951. There I was able to, uh, again, connect with the information about Iceland, about the culture, about the history, etc. And from there it was three years at the University of Iceland. Learned the ropes of doing genealogy at the National Archives and um, came back to Canada and have been at it ever since. The idea of the, of the exhibit itself uh, was sort of a natural outcome of this collecting process and the opportunity to present those pictures to the public came with the invitation to work at Hofsos. I field a lot of questions and inquiries, uh, both from North Americans and people from Iceland as well. The Icelanders, of course, want to know about their relatives who emigrated and what became of them and what their lives were like, and if they have any relatives in North America and how they can find them. People from North America go to Iceland looking for relatives as well, but they are also looking for their ancestral homesteads. They're also looking for genealogical data that will tell them about the past and about their ancestors. There's a, a stigma attached to the emigration, and there are different reasons for that, but uh, basically it's not viewed as a positive story so much. It was a very beneficial and necessary thing, and it's something that the Emigration Centre helps to educate everybody about. The 8th Street String Quartet is comprised of members from the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra. The quartet performs a wide variety of works from classic to contemporary. Hello, I'm Ben Sung, the first violinist from the quartet. The piece you'll hear is the last movement of the American Quartet by Antonin Dvorak, a Czech composer, who was actually the violist at the first performance of the Smetana Quartet. Uh, the American Quartet is so-called because Dvorak composed it uh, during, a, during a stay 
with the Czech community in Spillville, Iowa, and he tries to incorporate quite a lot of the sounds and the feelings of his time in America. This movement starts with a sound that you'll pretty instantly identify as the sound of the railroad.
Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make an interesting segment, please contact us at our website. For Prairie Mosaic, I'm Bob Dambach. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public.